Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second plenary talk by Dr. Michael Smith. Professor Smith will talk about the political economy of ancient economies. Dr. Smith is an archaeologist whose research focuses on the comparative analysis of urban societies, specializing in Aztec social and economic organization. He's a professor of anthropology in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at the Arizona State University. He also holds affiliation to the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning and the Center for Social Dynamics and Complexity at Arizona State University. And he's also a research, external research at El Colegio Mexiquense at Toluca, Mexico. Before we start, I just want to remind you that you can leave any question at any point during the talk. We will try to answer the most of them if possible at the end of it. Uh, Dr. Smith, please start. Hey, uh, thank you, Fernando. Let me share my screen here. Okay, is that uh, shared? Is that you're seeing the title? Okay, yeah. well, thank you. Um, I'm an archaeologist. I have studied uh, early um, economic systems in uh, central Mexico and uh, well, what I'm going to do today, uh, I have listed an outline here. Why is it hard to study ancient economies? I'll talk a little bit about the uh, diversity of uh, cultures, political systems, and economies in uh, what we today call Latin America. Um, I'll take a quick look at some of the long-term patterns of change. And um, then I'll focus on a comparison between the Aztecs and Incas, which allow us to examine political economy and institutions. Um, I'll address the question, economic growth in the past, and uh, a little bit on the legacy of these uh, early societies for colonial development. Um, so why is it hard to study ancient economies? Um, there's both uh, conceptual problems and uh, data problems. The uh, Conceptual problem, um, the field of anthropology for a long time was split between uh, economic anthropology, was split between formalists and substantivists. And the formalists said that formal economic models can be applied to non Western societies or ancient societies without modification. And the substantivists uh, said, well, no, the economy is embedded in society. Non Western societies had radically different economies that were not capitalists, and therefore we can't apply the same kinds of methods or concepts at all. And uh, these two positions, people talked to get against one another uh, and didn't make a lot of progress. In the field of classical studies, the similar debate was between the modernists, uh, the classical economy was sort of like the modern economy, and the primitivists, which were like the substantivists. Um, and the primary um, economists that the substantivists would call on is uh, Karl Polanyi. Uh, when I was uh, getting my training in uh, anthropology, I was told don't talk to economists because there's what they say about the modern economy is so radically different that it's not going to help at all learning about, say, the Aztec economy. Um, but uh, Polanyi saw this, this great divide, the, the great transformation, uh, his uh, title of one of his books, between ancient economies and modern capitalism. Um, and basically, you look at state control and, and commercialization. He said they were radically different, ancient economies and sort of non-Western contemporary economies, nothing at all like modern uh, capitalism. And But this led him to, um, to uh, make up things and distort evidence and data because he said, well, if you have markets, that's a modern capitalist thing. So guess what? Ancient societies didn't have markets. Um, but it turns out that he was wrong. There's a sort of middle ground between ancient command economies, state controlled economies, and modern capitalism. And that's pre capitalist commercial economies. Um, and the Aztec economy fits in here, but I mean, not the Inca economy. And it, it took a long time for anthropologists to sort of get beyond this Polanyi and to get beyond the formalist substantivist uh, debate. Now, if we look at early state level societies. This doesn't include modern economies. This doesn't include non-state tribal level economies. Uh, they're sort of arranged between uh, the Inca or ancient Egypt, high state control, low commercialization, um, through a scale through the Maya Aztecs up to Rome that had uh, sort of maximum commercialization and 
less state control. And I'll come back to commercialization in a, in a little bit. Um, I was once attacked by the Socialist Labor Party in their newspaper, The People. Um, and Smith portrays the Aztecs like the Flintstones, attributing modern capitalist practices to ancient peoples. Uh, the problem was that I said the Aztecs had an empire. I said the Aztecs had markets and money. And they said, no, they didn't. This is just attributing modern features to ancient societies. And, and this was the, the substantivist approach to uh, ancient economies. And um, I fired back a response, uh, which they published. And then of course they had a response to mine and I should put that on my Vita. I don't think this is on my CV. Um, so the empirical issues in studying ancient economies, um, I've been working with an economist for the last few years and he's interested in, in applying economic models to archeological data. And the big problem is where's the data? There's not enough data. Um, and um, we need material culture proxies for economic phenomena, whether it's trade or production or quality of life or whatever. Um, it's hard to, well, okay, biases in the written record, problems of synthesis. Uh, diversity of cultures and peoples. Um, so more than a thousand indigenous, now this isn't working. Okay. Um, many languages in, the, in ancient Latin America, uh, there's 31 Maya languages, just Maya alone. These, these are not dialects, these are separate languages, as different as, uh, as uh, French and uh, Italian. Um, Socioeconomic variation. Uh, this is a map from an old textbook showing different kinds of uh, economic adaptations throughout the, the new world. I don't like this map. Um, there's also a variation in types of polity. Um, you have small independent groups, sometimes called tribal groups. Um, most of uh, what's now the, the US, um, the indigenous peoples were uh, small independent groups at the time of uh, colonization. Chiefdoms, larger, have a hierarchical organization, but they're not as uh, institutionalized or as powerful as states. You have regional systems of city-states, um, territorial states, and uh, empires. Um, this is where the early state-level societies are around the world. Um, the two in, in the New World, Mesoamerica and Peru, uh, which is what I'm gonna concentrate on. So the diversity of economies, um, I'm gonna look at several, several aspects of this. Um, and if I use a, uh, a lot of examples from, uh, from the Aztecs, that's because that's what I do. Um, these are some of my books. Um, so intensification. Um, Great variation, intensification of agriculture and production from hunting and gathering through um, pre-industrial intensive methods. And what we mean by intensification is um, putting, putting extra additional labor into subsistence in order to get higher yields. Um, and so hunting and gathering is very extensive. Doesn't take a lot of labor, but does not produce high yields on the land. Tribal farming produces uh, more food per acre. Uh, at the cost of more work, and the wet rice cultivation is uh, very intensive. Um, just an example, a non-intensive form of agriculture that uh, was common in the past and the present, uh, particularly in Mesoamerica, is uh, milpa agriculture. Farming often maize, beans, and squash together in the same field, um, and it's, it's not intensive, and so the, the amount of food that can be produced is limited. But when you get to state level societies in the new world, in the Andes and in Mesoamerica, you have large populations, um, you have complex societies, um, additional uh, food is needed. And some of the methods that were used uh, include terracing. These are uh, some hillside terraces uh, built by the Incas in uh, South America. And it, they're quite impressive. If you see uh, the walls are, are well built, they, they go for long distances, they're similar width, uh, very well constructed. Um, compared to agricultural terraces in central Mexico where I've done field work, and uh, you can hardly even tell where the terrace is in the photograph there. And um, 
where the red box is um, are the terraces that we mapped. And they're sort of messy. They run into one another. Uh, and this points out a difference. The Inca terraces were built by um, gangs of labor organized by bureaucrats. And these terraces here were built by individual farmers uh, on their own. So they don't show the same level of uh, planning or uh, organization. Um, irrigation was practiced in uh, many parts of the, the ancient New World. Uh, some of the most impressive is here in Arizona and on the coast of Peru. It's an irrigation canal, and you can see those are people standing there in front of it. You can see the scale of this thing. Um, the coast, Pacific coast of uh, South America is very dry. There's places in northern Chile where it's never rained in, in recorded history. Um, but there's lots of rivers running from the Andes down to the Pacific Ocean, and they're not too hard to irrigate. Um, and so the reason this uh, fields on the right here look uh, green is that they've been irrigated. Um, another method is raised field cultivation. This is a, a method for, um, for reclaiming land from swamps where the uh, bottom of the swamp is piled up onto long parallel platforms. And um, it, it survives uh, south of Mexico City in Xochimilco and, and what are called chinampas. Uh, these are called uh, floating gardens for the tourists, but I'm sorry, the gardens don't float. <laughs> you know, they think floating is this guy in his canoe. Um, the diagram on the, on the bottom there is, uh, Describes some of these raised fields in uh, Lake Titicaca in, uh, I think this was from the Peruvian side. Um, this is a very intensive method. I mean, the, the Chinampas, South of Mexico City, um, were extensively cultivated in Aztec times. That's where the food came to feed uh, 200,000 people in the Aztec capital. Um, but they're still in operation in a, in a more limited sense today. And sometimes they can get four crops a year from these. So they're very intensive. Um, technology compared to old world cultures was, uh, was fairly simple, uh, basically a stone age technology. Uh, most cutting tools were stone. Here's obsidian um, on the left there. Uh, metal was developed and used mainly for ornaments and for rituals. Um, this includes gold, silver, and uh, bronze. These, these are bronze bells, alloys of uh, copper with uh, tin or arsenic. And uh, the thing is, bronze was only put to a, a very limited number of sort of technological to tools. Uh, most things were ceremonial or decorative, like these, uh, like these bells here. Um, no mechanization and writing. Um, Mesoamerican societies had writing systems, uh, which were lacking in, in the Andes. So on the left here is a panel of uh, Maya hieroglyphs. Maya writing was a uh, complete uh, writing system, um, meaning anything you could say in the Maya language, you could write in hieroglyphs. Um, other systems such as Aztec writing was more limited. You, it was not as phonetic uh, or grammatical as Maya writing, so you could only, only uh, certain kinds of messages could be communicated. In the Andes, there was no writing per se, right? writing being graphical encoding of speech, um, but they had uh, record keeping. These knotted strings called kipus um, were extensively used in the Andes, um, particularly in the Inca Empire. Um, craft production. Uh, for the Aztecs, there's two forms of organization for craft production, utilitarian and luxury crafts. So the utilitarian crafts are obsidian, volcanic glass, Ground stone, meaning stone for uh, grinding tools, monos and batates for grinding maize and other things, pottery, textiles, copper and bronze, and a paper made from uh, the bark of a uh, wild fig tree. Um, and the thing about the utilitarian crafts is most people who did these things were part-time workers and they were independent, meaning they produce for the market. They're mostly farmers, like in the off season, in the dry season, uh, would make pottery or, or uh, obsidian tools. So this uh, image from the Codex Mendoza shows, um, shows fathers teaching their sons their particular crafts. Uh, Pay no attention to the guy in the lower right says borracho, and that's a, <laughs> that's a different uh, 
part of the codex showing punishments for, uh, for crimes. Being publicly drunk was a crime for the Aztec. So this was utilitarian crafts, luxury crafts. Image from Diego Rivera here. Uh, Featherworking, stone sculpture, gold, lapidary production. Um, these were for the most part full-time artisans and they were attached, meaning they worked full-time for a patron, uh, a king, a noble, or maybe for, or for an institution like a temple institution. Um, they worked directly for these patrons and may or may not have additionally sold some things in the marketplace. Um, exchange, uh, obsidian, volcanic glass is very nice for studying trade because there's only limited obsidian sources in, uh, well, we're in any place. And here are the main obsidian sources in Mesoamerica, the, the squares on this map. And the obsidian from each of those different geological sources has different trace element composition, things that are measured in parts per million. Per million. So you can do a chemical analysis of your obsidian artifact and figure out exactly where it came from. Uh, and that's what this map is. So this, uh, this image on the bottom shows uh, obsidian blades which by the way, are the sharpest edge known to science. Obsidian, freshly made obsidian blade has a sharper edge than a surgeon's scalpel. Um, I'm sitting uh, on a hill of obsidian. There were rumors of an obsidian source near a site we were working on uh, near Toluca, Mexico, and we went out to find it. We found it, it was a whole hill of obsidian and um, turns out um, that it was very poor quality and so it was not used in the, the site we were studying. But. Um, that's the new site we found, which new source, but it turns out nobody, nobody used it for trade or production because it was very low quality obsidian. Um, and just ceramics, this uh, crude map here just shows uh, imported uh, types of ceramics in one part of central Mexico. And uh, basically these ceramics, like at the top right, those that's called Aztec three black on orange. Those ceramics are found all through this area. They were exported from the Valley of Mexico. And um, it's actually obvious without a chemical test, but we can also do various chemical tests to, uh, to show that they were imported in these other areas. Commercialization. Um, this is a, uh, a scale of commercial institutions and it's, it's a Gutman scale, meaning that any particular trait, for instance, marketplaces for goods and services, the Aztecs had those and, and they therefore had everything below it. They had written accounting systems, professional merchants, general purpose money and so on, but they, didn't, they only had a couple of the things that were above it. Um, so Egypt is very low commercialization, Aztec is greater. Some of the old world, uh, states of Syria, Rome, and, and medieval times are uh, very, very highly commercialized. Um, uh, money, what about money? Um, the Aztecs had two forms of money, um, cacao beans and cotton textiles. Cacao beans were grown on, uh, on trees in uh, pods and you, uh, well, see, that's an animation. You're supposed to be able to see the photographs behind it. Um, and you remove the pulp and you have the, uh, the cacao beans. The, the image that's blocking those, which would have come in as an animation. The picture I took, I put it on Twitter a couple of years ago and Twitter blocked it. They said it was sensitive material. <laughs> I don't know what they thought. It was a picture of turds or something. I, I'm not sure. Um, and cotton textiles. These are uh, cotton textiles from one of the um, Aztec uh, tax lists, a, a different portion of the uh, Codex Mendoza. Each of those uh, symbols on there is a, is a form of cotton textile and the little feather looking thing, thing looks like a tree means 400. So this is 4,000 textiles twice a year um, were paid in taxes by this one area. Um, were they really money? Um, well, traits of modern money, yes, they were media of exchange. You could uh, purchase things with cotton uh, textiles and cacao beans. They were units of account for keeping track of economic value. They were stores of value, but they weren't universal and, and convertible. They won't buy land and labor, or as uh, Lennon and McCartney said, they won't buy me love. Or as Pink Floyd said, it's a gas. 
Uh, I mean, this is this was my response when the Socialist Labor Party sort of called me out about my depiction of the Aztecs. It was not a capitalist economy because even though they had markets and merchants and money, um, land and labor were not commodities. Land and labor um, were not commodified, and and that's a distinction between the capitalist economy and these uh, earlier free capitalist commercial economies. Um, shops. Um, one way to tell, uh, distinguish uh, commercial economies is the presence of shops. So um, Ur, which is a Sumerian city in, in Sumeria, uh, Iraq today, uh, the Greek city of Olynthus, Sirach. Um, in all of these, you have small rooms that are parts of residences that open onto the street. And excavation of these uh, sites showed that uh, they had stockpiles of goods or uh, weights and, and measures. And uh, these were shops. And they're pretty common in you know, for Roman excavations and uh, medieval times, but non-commercial economies uh, lack shops. So you have um, Cahun, which is an Egyptian site, Piki Acta from the Andes, Teotihuacan in Mexico. These are all um, complex, large, walled residential structures, but there's no cases of little rooms that that connect to the outside that, that would have served as shops. Um, Long-term patterns. You have um, a similar basic uh, developmental sequence in both Mesoamerica and the Andes. You begin with domestication of crops and then of early farmers, and you have what's known as early horizon styles, um, where art styles spread over large areas. Um, then you have the development of early states and empires in each area. Um, these collapsed and you have a decentralized period. And then finally you have the development of late empires, Aztec and the uh, Puertopecha or Tarascan Empire in Mexico and the Inca Empire. Um, so the early horizon styles um, in Mesoamerica is known as the uh, Olmec, um, and the, the show some of the Olmec, uh, there's a sculpture and then some of the uh, symbols, very distinctive style of art. And it's found from the base of New Mexico down through Oaxaca to the uh, Pacific coast um, of Chiapas. And, for, and it, it, it spread perhaps from its, uh, from its core area there. On this map, it's called Olman, which is a weird made up name that nobody uses, but uh, this map does evidently. Um, you get a similar thing in the Andes with the Chavin style. It's a very distinctive uh, graphical style and it spreads over large areas. And um, archaeologists debate, what does this mean? Does it just mean that these areas were in communication with one another? That's pretty clear that they were. Uh, maybe it's the spread of a religion. Um, and in Mesoamerica, they debate what they're called a... Uh, mother culture model versus a sister culture model. In the um, mother culture model, everything started in the Olmec area and spread out to these other areas. In the sister culture model, you have the development of probably chiefdoms in all these different areas. And the development came not by the spread of ideas or institutions from one area, but through the interaction of widely separated uh, chiefdoms. So these are, topics of active uh, discussion and debate in archeology. span Early states and empires, the classic Maya are pretty well known. Um, they're known for elaborate urban centers in a jungle. Um, they're low density cities that, that, that settlement was spread out around these uh, ceremonial central areas. And, um, and they were very successful for many centuries. I mean, what people tend to have heard about the Maya is, oh, they collapsed. The Maya civilization collapsed and the cities were abandoned. And yeah, that happened. So you think, well, what was wrong with them that they collapsed? Well, we don't really know, but they were successful for uh, five, six, seven centuries. Think about it. How many cities in the United States today are successful for five centuries? We have no idea. We, ha we haven't gone five centuries yet. So um, 
They were very successful and then something happened. And that's in, in central Mexico at the same time as the Maya was uh, Teotihuacan, which was a large, densely settled, highly planned city. Um, the large, uh, large pyramids here. Um, the early states and empires, another in, in Mesoamerica is uh, the Zapotec state based in Monte Alban. This was a, uh, a uh, hilltop center on the top of the hill. The whole top of the series of hills was leveled uh, with a big plaza and a bunch of uh, temples and palaces. And then going down the sides of the hill, this isn't shown too well on this diagram, but um, going down the sides of the hill were residential terraces. They weren't terraces like Inca terraces where a row of stone would go for all along the hillside. They were small, irregular um, areas, blobs, that where a single household would live and, uh, and farm maize. So these were the uh, major um, states and empires in what, what we call the classic period in Mesoamerica. Um, in the Andes, you have two large urban imperial societies, uh, the Wari in Peru and Tiwanaku in, in what's Bolivia today. Uh, these are both images of Tiwanaku where, again, these were expansionist states. They traded with large areas. They expanded and, and conquered other areas. And, uh, and then they were collapsed and abandoned at some point. Um, a decentralized period, uh, there were still major states, major cities, Tula in Mexico uh, on the left here and Chan Chan on the coast of Peru. And then you had the late empires, the uh, Aztecs uh, and the Incas. So I'll make some comparison here. And um, one of the, probably the major economic comparison was a command economy uh, versus a market economy. So the Aztecs had money. Um, and they actually had a few things besides cotton textiles and cacao beans, but those are the main forms of money. No money in the Incas. Um, Markets, the Aztecs had marketplaces that distributed goods. Uh, in the Inca economy, the state um, distributed goods. The, um, some of the, um, the Spanish conquerors who went to Peru with Pizarro remarked, had been to Mexico and they said, man, there's markets all over the place in Mexico. Where are the markets here in Peru? Um, and there weren't some because it was a command economy. Uh, professional merchants in the, um, Aztec economy, which we know quite a bit about because uh, some of the main writers about ancient Mexico, particularly uh, Fray Bernardino de Sahagún, uh, devoted a lot of attention to professional merchants. Um, state workers did this and um, limited state control of the economy in Mexico, strong state control in Peru, uh, written accounting and quipu accounting devices in uh, in the Inca Empire. So the Aztecs, as well as Mesopotamia in the old world, was a market economy. The Inca were a command economy, and so was, uh, was ancient Egypt. Uh, let's see. Charles Tilley, uh, historical social scientist, uh, noted that states do two things. They exploit people, and they provide services. So. Um, well, I'm sorry. Okay. A direct control empire. Um, this was another difference between the Aztecs and the uh, Incas. Um, a lot of ancient empires were direct control. And um, the Roman Empire was for most of its area. Uh, you conquer an area, you administer it, you build roads, you build bridges, you build cities, you send out armies, you send out administrators and bureaucrats and governors. Um, and that's what the Inca did. And the Aztecs it was indirect control, uh, which meant they were conquering areas that already had city-state organization, that already had kings, that already had people used to paying taxes to their kings. And um, they basically told these local kings, pay us taxes and we'll leave you alone. So the Aztecs did not build provincial infrastructure. It's a striking difference. You go out in the provinces of the Inca empire, there's roads and bridges and cities and Inca style constructions 
and you go out to the provinces of the Aztec Empire, and there's none of that um, because it was in direct control. Um, another difference was taxes. Um, the Aztecs had uh, taxes in money, primarily textiles, and the Incas had taxes in labor. The only kind of taxes in the Inca Empire was uh, labor. So one reason those terrace walls are so straight is people were paying their labor taxes and the work was organized by government officials and they come out with uh, very straight standardized kinds of uh, constructions. Um, so Charles Tilley states uh, direct control empire, um, a greater exploitation, but provides more services. Uh, indirect control empire is less exploitation and uh, and fewer services. So I've compared the uh, Aztec Empire to to the mafia. Make your payments. I won't break your leg. Um, and basically, the Aztec Empire was a big protection racket. Um, if 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 the local city states stopped paying their taxes to the imperial capital Tenochtitlan, uh, they'd send their armies out and conquer them again. But they never sent their armies out to be stationed in the provinces. They never built cities or roads or any of that stuff. Um, and so if you want more context on uh, direct and indirect control empires, I urge you to watch Monty Python's uh, What Have the Romans Ever Done for Us? It's in the life of Brian. Uh, this clip is on uh, YouTube. And, um, and I highly recommend it. I show it in all my classes. Um, now, one uh, perspective on uh, comparative institutions uh, is from Asimoglu and Robinson's Why Nations Fail, where they talk about uh, inclusive versus extractive in institutions. Um, inclusive institutions allow greater participation and uh, protect the participation and rights of individuals. Extractive institutions basically extract wealth from uh, one sector to, uh, to benefit another sector. Um, this has not really been used very extensively by archaeologists, um, although archaeologists are just starting to uh, talk about institutions and what are institutions and how can we identify them, um, but that hasn't gotten very far. Uh, it's part of this issue of how do we operationalize uh, economic uh, concepts and phenomena like institutions. How do we operationalize that with uh, archaeological data? But one area uh, related to this that archaeologists have been active in is autocratic and collective regimes. Um, the old story was that all ancient rulers, whether you're talking about Aztec, Incas, or uh, Ramses here, played by Yul Brenner, were autocratic. These were despotic rulers who ruled with an iron fist, and people were downtrodden and oppressed. Oh, and then the Greeks invented democracy. Um, but what we now recognize is that there is a continuum from autocratic to collective rule. And um, there were quite a few collective or democratic societies in the ancient world. And uh, this has been uh, the best discussions of this are a book by two archeologists, Blanton and Farger, Collective Action and the Formation of Pre-Modern States. Um, they survey a series of uh, ethnographic and historical cases, not archeological cases, and um, and political scientist David Stasevich, his book, The Decline and Rise of Democracy, came out a year or two ago. Um, so basically, democracy or collective rule was much more common in the ancient world. And you can't just say that all, all ancient rulers were tyrants and they were all like uh, Ramses II. Um, so this has been uh, applied in, in Mesoamerica to a contrast between the classic Maya and Teotihuacan. These two societies were going on at the same time. They traded with one another. They were aware of one another. Um, and we think the Maya were more autocratic polities and Teotihuacan was more collective. Um, Maya kings had their images all over the place. Here's a stele at the site of Copan. Um, I excavated there with my wife, who's an archaeologist. This is our honeymoon. That's what archaeologists do on their honeymoon is they go excavate a site. Um, they put their faces around, and if you read the hieroglyphs that are, you see some on the side of the monument and on the back of the monument, they say the name of this person and what he, when he was born and when he ruled and how great he was. Uh, there's none of that at Teotihuacan. We don't have public monuments that show individuals. Um, almost every Maya city that's been excavated has yielded rich royal tombs. Uh, tombs in main pyramids that are very exotic and, and rich offerings. 
Teotihuacan, no royal tombs have been found. Um, and, you know, my, my colleague, uh, Saburo Sugiyama, has been excavating. He's done tunnels in the biggest pyramids of Teotihuacan looking for the tomb of the ruler, and he just hasn't found it. Uh, Maya kingdoms have massive royal palaces. At Teotihuacan, well, there's no obvious massive palace. In fact, this has been a debate for years. Was there a palace at Teotihuacan? And if there was, I mean, the government had to be centered someplace. Um, it was a lot more modest than, say, a palace at, uh, at Copan or Tikal. And then the Maya kingdoms had greater wealth inequality and Teotihuacan had uh, lower wealth inequality. In fact, it was Teotihuacan is quite amazing for the level of... Uh, of prosperity, um, the the average commoner dwelling was much bigger than for the Maya, than for the Aztecs, than, than in most other ancient societies. They're fairly luxurious and sort of a high level of prosperity. And, and one of the things we're trying to do here at Arizona State University is figure out how did Teotihuacan work and how did this all go together. Um, economic growth. Um, I put this in because it seems to me that, well, for a while, it seemed to me that the only question ec economists asked about the past was, was there growth? Was there economic growth? Was there more growth or less growth? <laughs> um, and well, can archaeologists study this? Um, and the kind of growth that we might have in the past is called Smithian growth. Uh, this diagram is from uh, a book by a couple of uh, economic historians. Um, Smithian growth is a specialization produced uh, from higher productivity and higher incomes and leads to per capita growth, which is a form of intensive economic growth. It's not uh, the same volume or it's not the same sustained over the same periods that um, that modern economic growth is. But, uh, but can we do this? Can we find this archaeologically? Um, well, one place we can look at this is the concept of the efflorescence. Uh, this is a concept of Jack Goldstone, who... He was arguing against some economic historians who said, well, there was no economic growth before the Industrial Revolution. He said, well, there was. And he, his examples were from China, England, Holland, you know, fairly recent um, cases in, in world history where efflorescences mean you have growth in population, growth in urbanization, growth in trade, growth in production, uh, cultural production, cultural exuberance, uh, leading to economic growth. Um, which then wasn't sustained. And, and, and the, the, the biggest application of this to the ancient world was uh, Josiah Ober applying this to classical Greece, talks about efflorescences um, in classical Greece and, and similar concepts have been applied to, to, uh, to the Roman economy and to growth. Um, and uh, it's just to contrast with the kind of growth that, uh, well, you've, this is blocking the citation. Well, there's citations underneath. <laughs> this is supposed to be an animation. Oh, well. Um, if there were efflorescences, efflorescences in the past, I think there were, they would have been in Mexico, Teotihuacan, and the Aztec, and, and probably the Maya. Um, and if there were in South America, Tiwanaku and the Inca, although people have not really applied this perspective in the Andes, um, and what would an efflorescence look like in a non-commercial economy? Uh, certainly demographic growth, urbanization, um, growth in production. Um, but these things have to be quantified and, and that's difficult archeologically. Um, so a quick example from a uh, archeological survey I did in the nineties, this is the Teotihuacan empire. It's a small empire in central Mexico. If you read someplace that Teotihuacan conquered the Maya, don't believe it, that's nonsense. Although Mayanists like to say that. Um, and I did a survey in the 1990s with a couple of my students in the Outback Valley and the state of Morelos, not too far from, uh, from Cuernavaca. And uh, what we did is we walked across the landscape and there's lots of artifacts on the surface. So we did five by five meter squares, we collected the artifacts. Um, we were able to tell the dating of sites and something about the sites from those collections of artifacts. Uh, on the top right, there's a couple of mounds. Those were, I think, classic period uh, temple pyramids. Someone's got a house on top of one of them today. Um, we produce maps um, of the settlement in the valley. Most of the settlement was concentrated in the uh, rich, deep floodplain in the north part of the valley. 
the uh, red squares on the right map are Aztec city-state centers known from documents from the time of the conquest. And so um, what we have here, the top graph shows total occupied area, uh, which is basically a proxy for population in the whole valley and the size of the largest settlement. Um, and there are these two peaks that are probably efflorescences. The first peak is during Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan came in, conquered this area. They were um, they were extracting cotton, which were brought back to Teotihuacan. Cotton would not grow in the Teotihuacan area, and this was the closest uh, cotton growing area. And then a, then a decline in in population, and uh, then a great another increase when you get to the Aztec period, which is the one uh, toward the right there. On the lower graph shows urbanization. Um, now, urbanization level depends on the size of the city. Um, so I show two levels here, 20 hectares. Now that's 1,000 people maybe. That's not a real big cutoff for a city, but some of the Aztec city-state capitals that had urban functions were on that level of size. Um, but let's take a more conservative uh, size, 40 hectares to be a city, 2,000 2, people. Um, you have two periods with urbanization rates above 20%. Again, classic period and the post-classic when it got uh, up to uh, to 40%. Oh, you can't see the top graph, can you? Oh, man. Um, uh, damn. So underneath this uh, uh, is my demography graph. Well, all right. I can show it later, I guess. If it... um, basically, the point of this, which is supposed to be an animation that comes in later, is uh, that urbanization rates of 20% in Europe were actually quite late. Um, and uh, except for the Netherlands, mostly after 1800. Um, now, one place where economic growth has been documented with archeological data is the American Southwest. And, um, and the reason that economic growth can be documented here is that the sites are well-preserved the there most of them were not occupied for a huge length of time and there's been a lot of archaeology which means you have a refined time scale and because there's been so much excavation we have a lot of data from a lot of sites so these are uh, pueblo sites uh in the area around uh santa fe new mexico the sites sort of look like this pochuinge there are room blocks surrounding uh big plazas with uh with kivas and um Basically, Scott Ortman, an archaeologist, and Jose Lobo, an economist, uh, produced a paper a couple of years ago, Smithian Growth in a Non-Industrial Society, where they plot population growth, ratios of certain kinds of artifacts. I'm not going to say too much about this, but they have they did scaling analysis of, say, possessions in the lower right against population. Those are uh, log scaled, and the scaling is super linear. Right, and that what that means is um, if a if a one site is twice as big as another, it doesn't have twice as many possessions. It has more than twice as many possessions, and so super linear scaling shows increasing returns to scale with the implication of of economic growth in here. Um, and the the one of the remarkable things about the scaling coefficients uh, that are highlighted here is that they correspond to the predictions of the theory of Louis Betancourt published in Science in 2013. Um, so I'll read this article. And uh, actually, we've done a lot of work on scaling around the world, including the Andes. And uh, um, oh, OK, so my, my, <laughs> my animation blocks the whole graph. Um, OK, guess what? There's a graph under here that shows economic growth rate. And you can see a little peaks coming above, uh, cl getting close to 2% growth, but only for a limited period of time. But 2% growth, that's not too shabby, but uh, didn't last. Um, so the economic legacy of these uh, indigenous societies, um, course of colonial settlement development was influenced by uh, these things. Regional demography and institutional patterns. Um, I tried to find a map to illustrate a point that I'm making that I make in classes. I could this. I don't like this map. On the left is a map by William Denovan of sort of agricultural systems. 
on the right is some map a colleague sent to me. Here's a recent map, Earth system impacts. Um, I don't like any of these maps. Um, the, the one I like the best is a crummy old map. I don't even have the source here. Um, agricultural development and population densities. And, and the point I want to make is that these two areas, particularly central Mexico, where it says Aztec Empire, oh, that's not in the right place on that map. Oh, well. <laughs> Uh, An Inca Empire in the Andes are demographic peaks. They have the highest populations, the highest population densities. These were states and empires by when the Europeans arrived. And you know what that means is when the, when the Spanish came in, and they could put people to work. People were used to working for a state, for an empire. They were used to producing a surplus. They're used to paying taxes. They're used to paying labor taxes. And this influenced the course of development, as opposed to, say, in the United States, where you have small scale societies, they were not used to paying taxes, they were not used to listening to a king, they were not used to working for anybody else. And any schemes to do that did not work out very well. So these, these patterns explain a lot of sort of large scale patterns of development. And just a few things to close with, some uh, Aztec to modern continuities. Um, in central Mexico, the Nahuatl language spoken by the Aztecs, there's still a million Nahuatl speakers uh, in central Mexico. Uh, most are bilingual with Spanish. Um, local community life and uh, local customs of um, housing, food, and so on blend ancient patterns with Spanish colonial and recent patterns. So community life, um, uh, these houses, this is a modern house. Uh, those are my ahados there years ago. Uh, these are some of my comadres. Um, they are making, they are, they are making uh, a, a fiesta, food for a fiesta. They're making tortillas on a griddle, identical to Aztec griddles. They're cooking mole in a big pot on the left there, identical to what we find archaeologically. They're grinding corn on a matate in the foreground. They are using a metal tortilla maker that the Aztecs didn't have. Now, they don't, they're not doing this all the time. They normally use more mechanized techniques. But when it's a fiesta, special food, um, the old methods come out. There's the um, manos and matates. These are things that I excavated. They're virtually identical to contemporary manos and matates for grinding corn and, and so on. Um, this, uh, this guy is building a house. And he is, it's going to be, it's an adobe house and the house foundations he's building are virtually identical to the house foundations we excavated. In fact, the house on the lower right is an Aztec house, stone foundation walls, mud mortar. Um, the techniques are almost identical. The only thing different that he's using on the left there is a uh, carpenter's level. Uh, and, but the, this house on the right was probably could have been built by one of his, uh, his ancestors. So, um, these well, are supposed to be a nice Diego Rivera painting, but it said you get my Twitter thing there. All right. Um, anyway, these were these were vibrant economies. There was a lot of variation, and uh, this variation affected later developments in the colonial period. And I talk about a lot of this stuff on Twitter, so there it is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. So we have a couple of questions. Okay. So let's, first one is Incas had barter systems, even though they did not have any formal price systems. Do you think money is a condition to have an advanced economy? Well, what do you mean an advanced economy? Um, you know, the Inca had, uh, had large cities, they could feed large populations. Uh, they were very effective at what they did. So, it depends what you mean by an advanced economy. Uh, the, the concept of commercialization, um, one of the reasons for the scale I presented was to try to get a more objective uh, feature of how economies vary rather than just saying one was more advanced than another. Uh, we have a question that says that any high school studies, the Mayan culture is presented as less important than the Aztec ones. However, by your presentation, the, what they gather from it is that Mayas, Mayas were more organized and productive. Is that a correct assessment? Um, well, uh, yeah. I mean, the Maya were, were very, they forged a society and an economy with major cities and artistic production and all, in a very harsh environment, in a tropical forest environment. And, and, and uh, just feeding all the population was a problem. 
And so they had this whole notion, the whole technique of raised fields uh, was pioneered by the Maya long before the Aztecs. Um, so the achievements of the Maya were incredible. Their writing system was a complete writing system. Anything you could say in Maya, you could write in Maya hieroglyphs. Now, the difficulty for scholars today is that they chose not to write about anything economic. <laughs> There's no economics in their text. It's all about kings and rituals and, and calendars. But uh, yeah, it was a very successful and, uh, and populous and large uh, society. Is there any evidence of horizontal exchange between peoples that were dominated by the Incas? So even if there were no exchange by the Incas, other peoples that live close by, did, could they share some of the traits or not? Well, yeah, you know, there were, there was a lot, actually quite a bit of exchange at the local level throughout the Andes. And at the, you know, at the borders of the Inca empire, they were trading with people beyond the empire. Um, and so there was a, a lot of exchange of goods. It just was typically not organized by commercial institutions. What role did geography play in making the Aztec and Inca societies quite different? <laughs> um, well, that's, that's a tough question. Um, and I mean, every society has to get by in this particular environment. Um, and so it, and so it has to exploit the resources and you know find how to be successful given the nature of what it has. So they all had to adapt their environment to feed enough people. So the Inca terracing and raised fields and, and the intensive agriculture was uh, done differently in the two areas, partly because of environmental differences. Uh, it's also a tough, tough thing to study because um, a lot of anthropologists and archaeologists think that if you start talking about the influence of geography, the environment, that you're being an environmental determinist. Um, and, and that's not really the case at all. The environment clearly played a large role. Um, but it's hard to you know, come with some simple statement of that. So it is now known that the Caral Empire had influence from Ecuador to Chile and Argentina, even covering some parts of Amazon. What kind of society would this empire be? Autocratic? Um, I guess, you know, there hasn't, there hasn't been as much research applying these concepts to the South American polities. Um, I would say probably more autocratic, but um, I think, you know, this, this needs more attention. This is a new thing that archaeologists are getting into is the collective and autocratic rule. And it's difficult to find clear archaeological markers of these things. Um, and so it, it's something that, uh, that we need a lot more research on and, and people are doing more research on right now. Is there any potential explanation over why the Incas or other South American societies did not have writing? Um, well, you know, one of the interesting things about early writing systems is that writing developed in different parts of the world for different purposes. The earliest writing in, in, in uh, Mesopotamia was developed for sort of economic accounting to keep track of uh, goods and, and trade and things. Earliest writing in China was developed to keep track of social groups and, and kinship and, and lineages. Uh, the Maya developed writing um, in order to keep track of calendars, time, and, and kings. Um, and so it's not, writing is not like a single thing developed for a single purpose. Um, they did, they, by the time you got to the, Inca Empire, I mean, that was a large empire since it was a direct control empire in a command economy. It was extremely bureaucratic. The Incas had lots of bureaucrats, had to keep track of lots of information. They need to keep track of information. And so the quipu was developed maybe in, instead of writing. Um, and there are pe few people, we don't fully understand how the quipus worked. Uh, they're knotted strings and they encoded numerical information. And some people think they may have encoded some linguistic information too, um, but I don't know, I'm not an expert in that area. So, 
Following the Robinson Asimoglu classifications of exclusive and inclusive institutions, how would you say the Incas were? Were they inclusive or exclusive? Um, well, uh, there, there's a, a longstanding interpretation that the Inca state was a socialist society because the ideology of the Inca empire was that it cared for everybody and took care of everybody. And, and opposed to that is the idea, well, this was a, an imperial ideology. They wanted people to think that they were inclusive and cared for people when really they were enriching themselves. Um, and I don't know, like, like I mentioned before, archaeologists haven't done as much with the sort of extractive and inclusive uh, institutions and um, I think that's that's an area that needs work. I think it's really interesting. So did I weasel out of it? Well, no. <laughs> how do you measure the living standards at the time? Is it possible to compare how a typical Aztec or a Mayan or an Inca live and which live better? Um, well, there's there's several ways to do it. One um, one way that archaeologists have done quite a bit is um, use the size of houses as a measure of wealth. And uh, there's a lot of reasons that that works pretty well. It's not always the case, but cross-culturally, generally the size of houses is an expression of household wealth. And so if you have a, a situation where you've measured enough house sizes, you can uh, study inequality with the Gini coefficient. And um, that's been done. I've done some of that in Mexico. The Gini coefficient for some of these Aztec sites was about 0.4. Teotihuacan's a little bit lower. Uh, the Maya had a higher Gini. Uh, some of the Maya sites, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Uh, so that's one way to do it. It's sort of the level of wealth inequality married with the gene, measured with the Gini index. Um, but also, in addition to the size of houses, you can use um, artifacts or the conditions of the house to get a, an idea of household wealth. Um, so, you, I mean, you, we can't do it to all sites in all conditions. You have to have a situation where either they've been extensively excavated or the houses are visible on the surface so they can be you know, studied and, and measured effectively. Um, but we, we put together a bunch of studies. We got, a public, we got a paper in the Nature on this in 2017, Tim Kohler et al. And, um, and we put together a book called 10,000 Years of Inequality, uh, published uh, Tim Kohler and, and Michael Smith. So that shows a lot of these studies we've been doing on the Gini index. A related question is about comparing living standards at the time of, on the eve of the conquest between Europeans and Native Americans who had the largest living standards. Ah, um, I don't know. That, that's a hard comparison. You know, it's it's in some ways it's for me, it's very frustrating working in the Aztec period. The Aztec period comes to an end, right, with the with the conquest of Mexico, and then you have the colonial period, and it's different kinds of evidence, and there's different kinds of scholars. There's you economic historians studying the colonial period. There's ar archaeologists like me studying the Aztec period, and it's very difficult to sort of bridge that gap. Um, and it's also very difficult to do the, the similar comparison of you know the the native peoples on the eve of colonization compared to the situation in Spain or, or throughout Europe. And um, I, I think as archeologists and historians spend more time on, uh, on documenting living standards and inequality and all, we'll be able to do that. But right now it's, I think it's difficult. Related to your assessment of kind of what money could buy in both Aztec society and the lack of money in the Inca society. A question asks more or less, is this kind of um, rebuttal more or less of the idea that money arouses first as a commodity? Like, is it possible to find another way to kind of exchange that is not money within these uh, societies? Um. Well, you know, one one thing that's interesting is um, is is the Egyptian economy, and the Egyptian economy did not have money in the sense of a of a of an object that served for exchange, but it had money in one sense, which was a unit of account called the deben, and so the Egyptians kept track of value, although they didn't have 
money as objects that you could exchange. And so they did transactions and they would be calculated the value of transactions based on, on the debit. So it was only one of the functions of money in Egypt. And so um, whether that same concept applies to a non-monetary economy like the Incas, I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know the data well enough, really. Um, so. Another question is, can we use anthropometrics to estimate living standards? Are there enough human remains that we have an idea of how long people live and their nutrition and rates of violence? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a strand of research along those lines. Quite a few, uh, a guy named Richard Steckel has done quite a bit and um, published studies along these lines. We get an idea of uh, nutrition, incidence of disease, stature, um, and it's, I don't know, my, my perception is that it's a promising line of analysis, but so far, you know, the amount that's been learned is, is not, not all that great. Um, and I've had some analyses done of, uh, of uh, skeletons I've excavated at Aztec sites. And basically the conclusion was these people were very healthy. Um, okay, that's nice, but uh, you know, I was hoping to find very wealth variation where the where the nobles, you know, healthier than the commoners, and uh, basically, was everybody was very healthy. At the beginning of your presentation, you presented the case that the Aztec economy could not be characterized as a capitalist society because there was absence of markets for land and work. So one of the one of the questions is related. What form of payment, or how could you get land or work? Um, well, land was for the most part owned or controlled by the nobility, and um, and and there are some cases where land could be sold among nobles. There's not a lot of documented cases, but there are some. So, how does your average farmer get hold of of land? Well, there were two ways. One was um, an organization called the Calpoli which was an organization of uh, like say a village in an area where the farmers together um, would farm a, a plot of land and the land was owned by a noble, but the noble sort of let the Kalpuli use part of it and the Kalpuli members decide how they would farm it or what they would do and they would you know, give a share to the, to the noble landowner. Um, another form was sort of like medieval serfs in Europe where um, commoners didn't have access to land through a Kalpuli and they were sort of landless laborers working on the estate of a noble. Um, and as for labor, well, most, most, uh, most sort of economic labor was organized on a family basis. Um, and, you know, if someone's making obsidian tools, it was probably a family business. Um, family members were working on it and then maybe selling in a marketplace. And so you don't have you know, a firm that hires a bunch of people of wage labor to produce you know, gold or obsidian or, or pottery. Another question is related to the characterization of the Andean societies. So would you say that all of them were in that sense relied on the direct control like the Incas or there were heterogeneity among them? Oh man, I'm not an expert on on the Andes, and uh, and I don't feel that I am up in the literature as as much as I could be. Um, I know there's a discussion that perhaps before the Inca Empire, you had more commercialized economies, and markets may have been more important, and then they became less important under the Inca Empire. Um, there's discussion of these issues among Andeanists, um, but I don't know. Read some of them. Don't read me. <laughs> Okay, I guess one last question relates to the continuity after the conquest. Do you think that the peculiarities of the Aztecs and the Incas kind of influence both the development patterns of basically the Spanish in Mexico and the Spanish in Peru? Um, well, I think it had a had an influence certainly in terms of uh, the overall demography and the um, organization of, of states and empires. Um, and so in, you know, colonization in the Amazon 
was very different from colonization in the Andes, not just because the environment was different, but because the people living there were, were a very different form of organization, different level of uh, population and density. And so between demography and, and political economic institutions, I think that explains a lot of the variation of, uh, of how the colonial economy got going. Well, okay, I think those were all the questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was fascinating talking with you about this, about, well, you're the expert about it, so it was great. Okay, well, thank you, this was fun. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, let's remind you that we will continue next week talking about the colonial economy, and see you then. <laughs>